Hey guys, this is Elise, I'm the organizer of the online event series Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. This project's purpose is to show that talking about racial experiences does not have to be threatening for personal relationships like friendships and neighborly relationships. We are not trying to solve racism in one video or make extravagant claims with what we're doing. We just want to encourage you to reflect and prayerfully engage with love and respect about a topic that is very sensitive for just about everyone these days. In this video, my very good friends Micah and Catherine are meeting for the very first time through this project and through me, and we're going to dive into our racial experiences that were shared during the previous intro videos, which you can see in this channel playlist. We'll spend about 20 minutes or so chatting, and we hope that it'll encourage you. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the microphone um, to either of you with a question or with an observation that you would like to share. Well, I have um, a question for Micah because I really enjoyed your story actually um, because it, it, it was not what I expected. You know, you started it out one way and then by the end of your video interview, it was completely the opposite. So starting out with um, no experience of race or the struggle of racism, and then very much seeing it um, face to face. So once, once you went into that world of um, people of color, how did you then bring that back to your original space of um, your family, your friends? Was that uncomfortable and did that did that lead to some important conversations? Yeah, no, and, and that's a, a fair question. Uh, you know, the thing that I think is often so challenging for people who have experiences similar to mine and families similar to mine is you, you have these experiences and you get exposed to something and it can really challenge our worldview. It can challenge the way uh, we view race history even um, and even how we view our own families and, and some of our family members behavior uh, all that becomes very impacted and when we reach this place of being woke we expect them to then suddenly be the same uh, and what's very very easy is to um, to reach that point and, and turn around to your family and and to not show them the same grace that people have been showing to us uh, for a long time. Um, and it, with my own family and, you know, and some of my friends that go back a long ways that had similar upbringings, uh, they're all in different places. Um, you know, one of the things that's really been interesting about this past month in particular is I, seeing who, who's where on their journey. You know, right now, I, the, the current state of, of events is really bringing things out of people and, and you're discovering where are they right now. And again, everyone's in different places, uh, at different places on the journey. I mean, I know some of the things that I, that there's certain things I still get caught on I, that are in the common vernacular. I, right now and I, and I i get a pause right then so then in talking to my family i and as they have those experiences uh some of them are way further along than i realized i a lot of them have reached a point of of recognition and acceptance and and even what can i do about it i to people that aren't maybe as far along as i thought they would be uh, from different experiences that i know that they have had and so i the biggest lesson that i've learned from that is I uh, is to be aware that everyone is formed by their experiences to be where they are today. I uh, and what is my responsibility is is, uh, is to contribute to their experiences. I uh, and I'm not responsible for their outcome, uh, but I am responsible for for planning just one more nudge in, in there. I uh, and to do it lovingly. I, to, to help try to bring them to, to a place of, of acknowledgement. That's, that's very sensitively put, and I really appreciate that line you said about showing your family the same grace that people had showed you. Um, I, I never thought of it that way. 
um, but it does lead to a certain frustration almost with yourself for not seeing things before, but also with the people around you. So that's almost another stage of um, reintegrating your like, experience back together um, and having peace in that. I really commend you, by the way, for that. Well, I, I, I maybe the other side of coming from an Appalachian family is we're we're a little rough and tumble sometimes, and I uh, you know if, if if you don't want I uh, if, if you don't want to have a long standing rift, we have to approach things that way, and I uh, it's one of the things that I appreciate about my family is that good job of of drawing a a line of what's the difference between respectfully disagreeing or or even respectfully fighting i uh, as opposed to letting hatred and toxicity uh creep in because it can and that can happen to any family no matter where you're from uh, i i just think sometimes when you're from the hills you're a little bit more loud about it i do appreciate that it, it is different depending where you are um so i'm from a midwest family and people think ohio is the midwest but where i'm from people would laugh if you said that <laughs> It's cool. real Midwest. Right. <laughs> and so um, there's a lot less diversity there actually than here, except around certain urban areas. Um, and my family didn't really, didn't really struggle with the lack of exposure because we adopted two biracial boys. So I have brothers um, who have some of these same struggles and the difficulty for my family was not realizing what my brothers would encounter as they got older. So I think that has led to its own series of challenges, but this, a similar growing process of having to reintegrate the different aspects of your worldview. You know, given the, the uh, Midwest Given the the Midwestern aspects of of upbringing, you know, a lot of people think of Midwestern politeness, right, uh, and, and manners. I uh, it's amazing sometimes how it can mask uh, underlying issues, uh, or or how it can even um, how it can even cut down on your awareness of uh, of certain things that I mean, one of the things that I wasn't even aware of until I uh, probably about six years ago. Um, was, you know, the concept of, of microaggressions, you know, and, and what, one of the things that continued to really surprise me about microaggressions was how it can be hidden in something that's very polite. I, and, and again, something I think that within the Midwest can be a, a particularly unique uh, display of some of our biases. I, and it's just fascinating. I remember there was one time in particular being in a bookstore I, and it was such a, a subtle, subtle thing um, that I, I, the, the person behind the counter that was working in the cash register uh, was handing credit cards or cash directly back into the hands of, of the customers. And so line and, and I didn't even think about it until the person right in front of me was a young black man and I, and the I, cash clerk put his his card back down on the countertop and slid it across and didn't actually hand it to him. He also didn't take it directly from uh, from the man. And I, I even it was such a subtle thing and I, I'm not even sure why I caught it. I uh, other than at the time I you know I had a friend that was really exposing me to to a lot of, of these concepts. Um, and, and again especially just within the politeness of what we're used to, sometimes it's something it's those really my don't necessarily um they don't mean that the problems aren't there it just means they're more hidden than they would be in some places you know, oops Catherine, we can't hear you Oh, there we go. There we go. 
<laughs> Whenever there's a more homogenized culture, and I would include the Midwest in this, I think it becomes easier to say my experience is like the experience of everybody around me. And I think that that plays into that sense of politeness hiding other layers of um, just blindness and assumptions that I think make it harder to have those conversations because it's like cloaked in good will. It's just very, um, very much lacking that experience of difference, I think. You know, one of the things that uh, especially you know, learning a little bit about what you do and uh, you know, around your stories, I, one of the conversations that's really uh, happening and just in last social media uh, is this idea that, that racism is not uh, a, a uh, policy problem, uh, that it's, it's a sin problem. And, you know, knowing that, you know, the ministries that, that you work around and in the role that faith has played in, in your life, um, and also recognizing that increasingly in the United States, uh, within the BIPOC uh, community, I, a lot of people uh, are, are gravitating to, to Islam. And, and so, you know, there begins to be a, a religious dynamic as well. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, for, for what you know and, and how that's impacted you, um, I'm just curious, how do you think the pathways forward to have these conversations when it's not just about race, it's about religion as well, and, and then those core societal culture questions? I love this question. No, there we go. I don't know why it turns off a couple times. Okay, so there, um, there have been a couple different thoughts going through my head as you, um, as you say this question. One of those strands has to do with the fact that there's a responsibility that people of faith have. And I've seen this in my own community and a lot of people starting to wake up to the, fa to the fact that they need to be just like anti-racist, pro-hospitality, which by that I mean not just assuming people are welcome, but maybe asking to see if they feel welcome and making sure they do. I think, I think even that very basic piece is a foundational responsibility of um, my faith and all faiths to really take that to heart. Um, people will feel not welcome if there's not an attempt to reach out and say, this, there's a place here for you. And I think, that, I think that's especially true if you don't look like and have similar experiences to other people in the pews around you. Um, so I've had a lot of experiences recently, um, just with several friends I have in my circle um, who do ministry um, building community with people of color and just creating a space for wonderful relationships and a more intentional space to talk about their experiences. And I've grown so much through my friendships within that community, but it's also opened my eyes to the need for more of that. Um, not just a general hospitality, but hopefully a place where people can also bring who they are, you know, your faith is a place where you bring your whole self. It's not just this little pocket over here. So if you are really going to feel engaged in your church, then your heart and your story comes with you. And there has to be a place for that heart, for that story. And also people to come around and be community, however you need it. And I think discerning those needs comes from really listening to the stated needs of the people who come, not what we assume the needs are. So those are just some basic thoughts um, from the church side of things. But in terms of different um, faiths and the fact that there's a sort of exodus happening from some churches of um, people of color for understandable reasons. Honestly, there's a lot of um, hurt that I've heard and a lot of um, experiences that would wound me. I've 
I, I have a lot of empathy for it, even though I've never experienced that. But it's just, it's difficult. It's difficult to make way for the newness and for a new community, new hospitality, without dealing with reconciliation about those hard truths and those hard parts of people's stories. But also in terms of the exodus from Christianity, I would say it is, it is true to say racism is a sin and racism is a policy problem. It's possible, you know, to believe in both, but how we portray that to people not of faith um, is important. So I don't think it's helpful to say racism, racism is a sin problem, period, to somebody who doesn't believe in God. It is helpful to say racism is, in my, in my belief, harmful to human beings and to our community. And um, when I, when I don't, don't believe in it because it's sin, it's not to say um, there aren't structural problems too, but I believe that we need to fix us first and we need to work on our hearts and we need to develop new habits. And so there's ways of using different language, but that's again, another responsibility we have to use language that people can receive. That's communication. You're not communicating if you're saying something that doesn't mean anything to the person receiving it. Does, does that somewhat answer your question? I feel like there are so many facets, but. There are so many facets. In, you know, the, the only thing that I think that I, I have any disagreement around whatsoever at, at all is you know, of what comes first. And I, I think this is very chicken and egg. I, you know, people are, are used to, uh, you know, for, for especially for those that are right of center, when they think of racist policies, they think Jim Crow. I, uh, and I, uh, we got rid of the Jim Crow laws. I, uh, we, uh, we we don't actually have laws that implicitly state specific races and say that uh, that those individuals are uh, are banned from certain things or must pay certain taxes. We don't have that anymore. Uh, and I think that one of the things that uh, will become increasingly understood in in coming months. I hope so. I'm working. Uh, better known. Uh, is that sometimes racist doesn't have to do with intent, but rather with outcome. Um, and it's kind of, kind of uh, in the same way that when we talk about ourselves and our hearts, that sometimes it's not that we have hatred, uh, it's more that we have misunderstanding. So and when we have those misunderstandings rather than hatred, again, that's not intent, that's outcome. Uh, and I think an example of, of, that we see in that today in, in Ohio, uh, one out of five jobs in Ohio require a government license in order to work in that job. And when you have a government license requirement, that means there's also an education requirement. Um, a really, really good example of this is in Ohio, in order to braid hair professionally and to make money of it, and this is something that is very uh, specifically unique to the uh, uh, to the BIPOC community, uh, where it's more common to have enough of a population that that you can sustain a career with braiding hair, it requires a full blown cosmetology license in Ohio, fifteen hundred hours of training, in order to be able to braid hair professionally. You know, that's not something that I don't think anybody set out to say, let's be racist. Let's, let's make sure that we don't have people in, in the minority community that are braiding hair. I don't think that was the intent. But you, they did create limited economic means to be able to have that as a job. I think that for people who are right of center, it's easier to understand something like that. Uh, to understand, okay, this is something that has a disproportionate impact in the minority community. We can get them to the point that they can understand terms like systemic racism and, and what that might mean, um, but that, that takes time. And, and, and because it takes time, the same way it takes time to deal with the issues in our hearts too, chicken and egg, which one do we tackle first? Uh, and, and I think that the answer is both. We have to work for positive policy changes in, in our state and our nation in our towns and simultaneously uh, engaging with each other. I agree with everything you said. Um, 
Um, I love everything you said, Micah, because it's, it has to be both or um, there's something hypocritical about not really caring about the full story of people's lives, you know? And there is, there is sort of a connection between the systemic and the personal experiences they interplay. But something I forgot to mention earlier that I think also plays into this um, is that we're not just concerned at the end of the day with illuminating racism. That's a good, we need to get that goal done too. But because like you said, that is a long process. What can we do right now? I think besides working for those goals, places of faith have an especially um, important responsibility to be there um, for, any, for anyone who's experienced racism because at the, at the end of the day, that is, that is what people need the most. Someone to help hear them, um, represent them, um, like just advocate for them, be like there. And I think people of faith, that's our number one goal but in a stated way, but to make sure that happens on the ground, I think is a, an important piece of this conversation. Well, I guess I can, you know, reflecting on some of the pieces that you guys are sharing. Um, I'm, I'm like really appreciating the pieces that you're bringing together about chicken and egg, about big picture, small picture. And I think that there's something that comes to mind for me as I'm hearing you speak. Um, and sharing from each of where you are professionally, like your niche expertise is, is like, you know, cause I know like, I know that it's coming from that place of like so much study, so much experience, so much work, so much like where you've dedicated your lives. Then I've been like, oh, I'm thinking about my work too. So like in family systems work, cause I'm trained in, family systems work, there's always like a couple approaches. And I'm and I'll tell and I'll say the reason that I'm sharing this right now is because I'm curious to hear your ideas too um, about directions, whether it's ministry, faith-based conversation, politics, whatever, representation. Um, so there's like two types of family therapy. One is structural family therapy, the other is strategic. Structural th family therapy looks at who are the power players and what is each person's role and then using the looking at how those roles intertwine and has become dysfunctional when it used to be functional. It served a purpose, but it no longer does. So how to then reorient and reposition people to relate with one another in a functional way. Strategic family therapy is pretty much what it sounds like, using strategy to achieve certain outcomes for a family. And then there's two ways that therapists can be aligned with the treatment to help the family system. One is to join the family system. And so they take on a role of their own and they become part of the family. This one is very tricky to do, um, to do well because there's no way to predict the future. What if someone dies? What if um, someone moves all the way across the world and there's no way to communicate. What if, um, you know, so many different things. So it's hard to do very well because as much as the, the therapist has joined the family, they also have to exit the family for the family to continue without them. Then there is the not joining type where the therapist is outside of the family system and, um, and they're partnering. They're like a consultant. They provide interventions they use it and they enact it and they, and they um, use what works for them. So I'm, I'm sharing all this um, again, because I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of like, I think if I, I guess if I put it into a different, if I frame it a certain way, I feel like something that I notice with friends, with people that I come across is that when it comes to really hard so like topics that demand soul searching that really 
come at the core of who you are because it, it, it brings up to a bright light what is your moral compass and what are your core values and what is the world that you envision for your children and your future? Like it brings up all those things at once and racism is one of those topics that does it. Not every topic does this, but it, this is one of them. And so I see some of my friends and some people I know and they're like, well, let me stay outside of it. And then I know some people who are like, let me jump right in with the intention to come out and then I see some others who are like, actually, I'm just part of the family system. So <laughs> um, maybe policies and procedures and, and church and things are so like metaphorically the therapist to help guide us, um, whether that's strategically or structurally. Um, I, I don't really have like, the, the question I have isn't like aimed to like get a certain response. I'm just curious, like, what do you think? So just thinking about um, your really well explained um, definitions, I tend to see the difficulty here um, for both society and churches. Like you said, there's not really a clear role for, um, for white people in engaging with conversations about racism in a sustainable way. Does that make sense? So we're, it's like, let's come in and touch the problem and go away, which that, that's not sustainable. It doesn't create lasting change for anybody. It's not a cultural reality. It's just something that you did. And now you can check it off the nice person task list, you know? Um, so in terms of having a deeper um a deeper reality form that's going to take a long time because that just means a lot of interconnection a lot of gradual healing it, it, it's messy but i don't think at the end of the day either of the approaches you mentioned will work in this case because it treats the system as closed with an outsider and to become one family it's more like a blended family in my um, in my experience with blended families that um, they take a long time to form on average seven years. Um, when I first heard the statistic, I didn't quite believe it. And then I started meeting families and it's true. Um, but it takes that long because everybody has to redefine their roles, redefine their habits, find a new way of living. I, I kind of think it's like that. And for a blended family to work, it does take um, it does take being willing to suffer for a while. So I, that is a very, I know it's a, it sounds like a bad solution, but I don't think it's a bad solution. All the best things in life and in family and in community come at the price of some being willing to take on some suffering. In fact, that's our Christian perspective as well that um, the cross has meaning and we need to be able to suffer for that kind of unity. You know, one of the things that occurs to me, I, you know, cause, cause you mentioned principles, you know, around this and I, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've recalled is, you know, I remember when, uh, when my parents were getting divorced, I, one of the things that we had to do was uh, we had to go through court mandated uh, family counseling to uh, really evaluate some of the recommendations that were coming from the magistrate uh, for what the parenting agreement would look like. And I, I remember from, from that counseling, there were, there were a few things that, that came out of that that were just really, really interesting. Um, and, and some of it was really demoralizing too, because I, the, uh, the social worker that did the evaluation, I, you know, actually wrote in, in her notes that we were one of the most divided families that she had encountered in her career. Um, and that was kind of a demoralizing thing, right? Because, you know, it just sets you back a certain amount. I'm like, gosh, we're that bad. I, uh, and so one of the things that strikes me is, you know, when, when we talk about this in, in terms of, of counseling and we're talking about race, 
I don't know if, if that counselor's, uh, I'm sorry, if that social worker's assessment was accurate or not. I don't know. Maybe we were. Maybe we're the, the most divided family that she had ever encountered. However, I, when we're talking about race and we're talking about our friends and we're talking about our faith communities, we shouldn't overstate the problem. That's one thing that comes to mind. Two is in the same way that everyone encounters uh, and deals with their trauma differently, uh, which way we approach these conversations probably also varies. The, the final thing that comes to mind for me with that, particularly that comment about principles is I, it takes discipline to know and acknowledge your principles and what you really believe. And two, it takes even more discipline to apply it into things that are emotional because at the end of the day, I, it seems to me we're all in that embedded scenario. We're all in this. We can think about it if we want from a removed scenario, but I think we're fooling ourselves if we think we are removed from what's happening. If we are removed from, from the race issue, I don't, I don't think that's reality. And so to apply our principles in a moment that we are in the middle of it and it hurts and it's uncomfortable. And for me, whether I'm talking about, about my religious convictions or if I'm talking about political convictions for me, I, I'm able to boil it down to four principles for me. And, and, and I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by people that uh, have helped me ar arrive at that. And, you know, for me, it might be four for, you know, for you, it, it might be eight. I, I don't know, but to be able to have that kind of, of self-awareness and be able to apply it, you know, w even within this conversation, I've talked about a, a lot of this as being outward communication. I maybe as I, as I think, you know, listen to what I'm saying right now and I apply it to my earlier comments. I, I even think in terms of, introspection is probably where this starts. Um, Micah, I am so sorry to hear what you, I'm just so sorry. I had no idea that anyone, um, it's confounding actually to hear that a social worker had spoken, put into writing an evaluation, a forensic evaluation of your family in that way. Um, rural counties, things happen. Yeah. But professionally, you know, because I'm, I'm in counseling. So I'm just like, what, like what one individual has lived the whole history of social work and counseling and met every particular family and client to be able to say my personal experience, therefore public record, here's an evaluation to say, this is the most divided family. That's a very condemning statement. And it was just, my professional opinion is that that's out of line. Um, and logically too, aside from being professional, it cannot be, it cannot be a true statement about any particular family from a human being. Um, it's just not a human's place to say that. That was so, so wrong. Um, so I'm very sorry on, on behalf of my profession that your family received that kind of treatment. Um, it affects children's development in a certain way and that's not okay. Um, but also because you're my friend, that makes me mad that someone did that to you. I'm really sorry to cut this short. I love talking with you guys and it's always so fun um, to introduce my friends to one another. And I hope it was fun for you guys. I hope it was encouraging for viewers to watch. And I hope it gives people the strength to know that your voice matters, especially in conversations with your friends. Your experience is valid. You matter. And possibly, you know, given what um, Micah's just said, if your experience and voice is not valid to your friends, maybe it's not a real friend. <laughs> maybe, or if it is a real friend, maybe that relationship needs more work to be built up to a place that um, earns the trust to talk about these kinds of things. Um, and we all need to come back, come together. It takes all of us, like what Micah and Catherine were saying. So with that, uh, God bless, and uh, we'll see you all later. <laughs>